So a, a few weeks ago, I was watching a documentary um, about this man, Seymour Bernstein. And uh, Seymour is a pianist. He's about a thousand years old. He was at least 90 when this documentary was produced. It was produced uh, by or with Ethan Hawke. And it is uh, a conversation between the two of them that begins with Ethan uh, describing the time, the first time he met Seymour at some, whatever, some overlapping awards event or a New York dinner or mutual friend or wherever it was. And Ethan Hawke, an actor, uh, at the time going through some confidence, some questions about his abilities or his uh, objectives or his, uh, the point, the point of being an actor. And he said that the words that Seymour spoke to him then were pro profound, deeply useful, deeply meaningful. And, and so they continued to talk and, and this documentary evolved out of that conversation. At one point in the film, Seymour is speaking to the camera and uh, is, speaks specifically about, well, here's the quote. It, it, it struck me at the time. Uh, I went back and rewound it often enough for me to write it down here. I don't expect you to be able to follow along with my handwriting, which is appalling. Uh, but also kind of be, you know, representative, let's just say. So here's the quote. Motivated by a love of music and possessed of a clear understanding of the reasons for practicing, you can establish so deep an accord between your musical self and your personal self that eventually music and life will interact in a never-ending cycle of fulfillment. Motivated by a love of music and possessed of a clear understanding for the reasons of practice, you can establish so deep an accord between your musical self and your personal self that eventually music and life will interact in a never-ending cycle of fulfillment. a clear understanding of the reasons for practicing. So obviously one way of hearing that is uh, practicing at the, at the piano, getting your fingers in shape so that you can uh, approach the technical difficulties of the music, overcome those technical difficulties and present the music in a way that is uh, fluid, that is transparent, that is filled with character and personality that is phrased appropriately. Your fingers have the skills that are required through diligent practice and through the appropriate uh, uh, conditions and focus of practice. The reason for that practice is to be uh, a more honest, more authentic performer. But I like to think that practice here means more than that. I use the word practice on this channel all the time to refer to uh, meditation, to refer to uh, habits and routines, really to generally refer to the scrutinized life, the examined life. That practice is the deliberate attention to elements of my day-to-day -day life and that through that recurring practice, a life unfolds that is not necessarily shaped by large dramatic gestures or events, but is instead formed by the repetition of chosen actions. Whether those actions are practicing piano or recording YouTube videos or writing music or uh, studying French, trying to learn the game of Go, it is uh, a deliberate choice as to what input comes into my brain 
and what output comes out, uh, what output is produced. I am a fervent believer that we are all creative machines simply by the fact of being human. And that uh, some of us may spend more time thinking about this musical self, this creative self. Uh, but we all have a musical self, a personal self, a historical self, an emotional self. We are made up of multitudes of selves that are activated in different scenarios or from different triggers or different events. Um, Whitman, right? We are a multitude of selves and uh, our metabolism sustains our physical body which in turn sustains these mental states, mental selves. And we have the opportunity to cultivate some self uh, or the other. And that is the residue of practice as well. We, we create poetry as we move through. You know, in other places, I've said that we uh, create this effluvium, this detritus of poetry that follows us like a chemtrail on an airplane uh, that we just exhale as an aura with our emotions and our thoughts and our fantasies, our aspirations and our hopes, this sort of intimate exude extrusion, the complicated contradiction of the intimacy of our poetic thoughts and the public nature of extruding as we pass by, as we interact, either um, close by, unintended, deliberate. These are our, our selves that are contained within the boundary of our mortality. And practice is what allows us to observe that, to become aware of that, uh, to dance within them. This never-ending cycle of fulfillment. That reminded me that George Orwell wrote an essay on called uh, "Why Why Why Write." And he begins that essay here with the, a concept of the true nature. He's, he gives a bit of biography at the beginning of the essay. It's, it's readily available online. I've cut a little bit of a few points that I wanted to talk through. Um, at the beginning of the biographical section, he says that as a young person, he denied the urge to write, but he knew that doing that would outrage his true nature, which is quite a romantic image of writing, uh, we think of, we, I have often thought of George Orwell as a bit of a curmudgeonly socialist writing uh, political tracts that are intended to highlight poverty or um, uh, anti-fascism, um, political ideals. But he speaks about that directly. In fact, if I were to jump to the fourth of the reasons that he gives about why writing, it is political purpose. But he's quite interesting here. He uses the word political to mean the desire to change the world, the desire to push it in a certain direction, which, yes, could be a policy discussion. It could be a discussion of the nature of self, the understanding of those multiple selves requires a change in our interaction with the world and with each other. It highlights the ground of compassion and it makes necessary acts of kindness. So when I combine music and meditation, that for me is a political stance in the sense that I believe it requires a change in our social structure. I don't talk directly about 
politics, meaning government, governance, elections on these channels, mostly because when I do talk about politics in my daily life, I end up ranting, and it's not entertaining. Uh, it gets me all worked up, and nobody around me has a good time. But if I could find the right tone or the right format, I would talk about public policy for public transport, for example, which is something that drives me batshit fucking crazy that uh, on a main route into town, which I live on here, uh, the sort of an erratic 20, 25 minute bus route that goes into town on the major route into town. Why isn't it every three minutes? Why shouldn't anybody on this route step outside, get on a bus that is free because we've already paid reasonable taxation and also because we don't expect to have individual combustion engines anyway let's go back over these other points sheer egoism well of course yes we all have an ego and that ego drives us to seek acclaim i wish i had more than 700 subscribers on my channel and if you're listening to this and you haven't subscribed, you should. Like Orwell says, it's humbug to present, pretend this is not a motive and a strong one. But the goal is to put it in the correct perspective. The ego self, the attributes that we associate with uh, pride or de um, desire for recognition, um, the desire to control or dominate, those are part of those selves. Um, and look, look we, there's no dictate on this, but I would choose to not emphasize that part and instead emphasize the part that is more understanding and compassionate. <laughs> Use the egoism as a locomotive that pushes. Sometimes the thing that will get me over a block or anxiety is really just embarrassment of not doing something a sheer egoism you know use it that way that's fine number three i'm jumping around these in any which way historical imp impulse it's actually a uh, motivation that isn't super strong in me um, i'm not a journalist i'm not a researcher um, if i write essays they are sort of magical fiction at best uh, but i have a real appreciation for this when i read for you know for relaxation of pleasure uh, i read a lot of biography uh, i read a lot of um, historical nonfiction. I, I appreciate this impulse as a reader but as a writer it's not something that, that drives me and then aesthetic enthusiasm. So I think this is very interesting because um, using words for the sound of them uh, can dictate the meaning. And there's sort of a balance in the essays that I write in uh, choosing the right words to express the idea that's in mind. But there's an equal happenstance where the sounds of the words indicate the meaning that I'm looking for. Do you know what I mean? There's like, it's a, there's, it's not a circle. It's a, it's a series of interlocking waves, perhaps. And one of those waves is the idea and the clearest way to use language to express that idea. And then there's the language itself that might suggest an idea. For example, I used the word happenstance a minute ago. It doesn't make any sense, does it? But I liked it, and I'm going to keep it, and I'm going to use it because uh, I'm enthusiastic about it. And I think this lines up with music um, composition uh, for, for me. I am becoming a much more confident composer the less I think about the end state of the piece. There may obviously be some constraints or some guidelines to start. If I'm writing for a piano and voice, I'm not going to hurdle away into a hurdle. I like hurdle. Hurdle, like running and hurdling. Um, steeplechase. I'm not going to steeplechase 
from a voice and piano piece into 12 bassoons and a theremin. If I do, I've now written a completely different different piece. Uh, but I do find the most effective way as I'm exploring the craft of composition is to simply look at what's in front of me, uh, whether it's a you know a pile of sketches or a blank page or a page with uh, an initial impulse that I've notated down. I'll look at it and say, should it be longer? Should I repeat it? Uh, can I extract some idea from that initial gesture and do something different with that? Should it be in a different part of the piece, depending on how far in the composition I've got? Maybe I'm looking at 20 pages and it's a question of moving things around, deleting things entirely, letting something happen more and taking out the contrast, adding more contrast, really looking to see in that moment uh, what's required and then coming back again the next day and asking the same question. And then at a certain point, there will be no response. And then the piece is done. It is using the enthusiasm for writing to confirm the output of the writing. So for me, I wrote down here, I right? thought so the Seymour uh, uh, has this uh, cycle of fulfillment, right? The cycle of fulfillment. And I think for me, um, particularly when I'm looking at my electronic music, but also um, writing for, for piano, there's a liturgical drive, less so at the piano. My piano music is, is exploring that poetic halo, but exploring it in order to launch off it, perhaps, or to see it in its perspective. That's hard to put into words. If I knew how to put that into words, I probably wouldn't write piano music. I would write, I would write words. Uh, in my Euro rack, in my electronic music, the, the drones, the sort of austere sounds that I tend towards feel to me like they propel the listener beyond the sound, which is very much why I appreciate Messian, why I spend a lot of time with Messian and talking about Messian, because I think his music and his techniques and his awareness of his techniques really do say uh, the surface of the music, whether it's the rhythmic gestures, whether it's the uh, temporal sense of unfolding patterns, um, whether it's the stasis of the retrograde, all of that is there to suggest beyond the sound. And in Messian's case, to suggest to the truth of the uh, sacraments of the Catholic liturgy. Uh, and for me, it is to suggest the um, experience of sound as a platform for uh, experiencing enjoying, examining, scrutinizing the nature of the self. So let me leave it there for now. Uh, thank you for uh, listening this far. And uh, uh, keep your wits about you. And please do drop a comment or a question if you have any thoughts or suggestions or corrections. Um, Cheers.